Hey guys, this is Robert Breedlove from the What Is Money Show. And as you've learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is NIDIG. NIDIG's mission is to facilitate financial security for all. They accomplish this by bringing a high level of professionalization and sophistication to the Bitcoin marketplace. As a true game changer in the industry, NIDIG is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. By using NIDIG, you will gain access to an end-to-end -end institutional-grade platform, providing Bitcoin OTC transactions, Bitcoin collateralized borrowing, secure custody, asset management, derivatives, financing, market research, and more. And all of these services meet the highest regulatory governance and audit standards. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, NIDIG has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and is leading the way for ongoing institutional adoption in this nascent asset class. So please be sure to check out NIDIG as a single source for all your Bitcoin needs. Hey guys, welcome back to the What Is Money show. I am sitting down today with Mr. Dominic Frisbee who's the author of a excellent book called Daylight Robbery, covers the history of money and taxation uh, through a lot of very interesting angles. Dominic's also written a number of other books on monetary history, and I hear occasionally he moonlights as a stand-up comedian. So, Dominic, welcome to the What Is Money show. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for having me, Robert. It's, I have this weird double life as a sort of financial writer and a stand-up comic, and you wouldn't really think that the two um, work together, but they bizarrely, it kind of works all right. I do <laughs> well, libertarian-themed comic songs. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I really admire both professions because I'm big into monetary history and I'm also a big fan of stand-up. So oh, cool. I think you're probably a pretty interesting guy. I'll tell you what we can do at the end of, the, end of one of these shows, if you like, Robert, as I'll give you... Um, I'll give you, I'll send it to you. I'll give you one of my songs and you can play, play out the end of the show with one of my songs, if you like. Definitely. I think you'll, I think you'll like the libertarian. I've written the libertarian national anthem. I think you'll find that fun. Uh, <laughs> I would love to hear <laughs> it. <laughs> so I've been reading your book, Daylight Robbery. It's excellent. It's comprehensive. It's telling really the history of the world through a lens of money and tax, which I thought was fascinating. Sounds you know, in the modern age, we think tax is the most boring subject alive, but it really has uh, been a critical component of, of human action across history. Yeah, and, I've, I've cut. Sorry, go on, you go. No, I was just going to say it's it starts from first principles. You know, it starts at the beginning of time. Um, and that's really kind of the, the purpose of this show is to go deep on topics. So I would love to start at the beginning and have you just walk us forward. Well, I'd, I'd be delighted. And I, I, you're absolutely right, Robert. Um, I've come to having written that book and thought about it and just started to look at everything through the prism of taxation. I've just once you it, it's a bit of a red pill moment, really. <laughs> mm -hmm. And once you see things through this way, you go, it, it, it kind of explains everything, every war, every major decision, every revolution, every revolt. Um, you know, tax is control, tax is power. And yeah, it's very hard. Once you've, once you've gone, had your taxation red pill, it's hard to come back. And we think taxation is a boring subject. You know, it's for accountants and economists, but actually it's everything. Tax is power. And right. um, yeah, once, once you get hooked, you, you, it's a bit like heroin. There's no coming back. <laughs> <laughs> it's. I did this uh, podcast with Lex Fredman recently, and one of the recurrent themes was that humans have this proclivity to try to get something for nothing. It's. It's. Yeah. It's, it's what not only makes us innovative, but also makes us coercive to one another. We're always trying to get something for nothing, and it sounds like tax is just the ultimate something for nothing. Well, it it is if you're the person who's receiving the uh, the taxes, right? Um, and. Uh, and it, I mean, taxation is certainly a form of coercion. And they, in fact, there are some lovely stories. They, leaders use tax to try and make people behave in a certain way. And so, you know, for example, 
you know, we've got this big green energy theme going through life at the moment. And, Mm -hmm. you know, tax structures are being designed in order to push people Mm -hmm. into green energy and green energy is receiving huge amounts of subsidy, which is, of course, comes from taxation. Um, And, you know, for example, we've got a sugar tax here in the UK. They've decided that sugar Mm -hmm. is bad for you, which it is. But they've decided that you are not intelligent enough to decide for yourself on whether you should drink sugary drinks or not and therefore they're levying a tax for your own good of course Crazy. and um but the um peter the great in russia uh, um decided that he wanted to make russia more like western europe and he decided that beards were unfashionable Hmm. And this is back in the day when, you know, a beard served a very useful purpose in deep, cold, dark Russia. And um, but he decided he wanted people. So he levied a beard tax. And so if you wanted to wear a beard, you had to hang a token from your beard that proved you'd paid the tax. Um, And the token said on it on one side of the token, it said, the beard is a superfluous burden. <laughs> and then on the other side, it said tax paid. And if you didn't have this token hanging from your beard, um, quite often you could be visibly and forcibly shaved in public. You know, you think wow. COVID-19 controls and masks and all that are bad, <laughs> you know, being visibly forced, you know, quite shaved in public might be, might've been quite a humiliating experience. And um, so as a result, people started, you know, wearing beards less because, and it was all because Peter the Great had had this grand design on on beards and being more like Western Europe. So it's a nice little historical, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it's um, such a lever for controlling human action, basically at scale. Um, And it's, yeah, it's been, I guess, so so embedded in modern society that we we hardly stop to think about it. that was also kind of the premise for the title of the book, right? Is this, this robbery of daylight, which was a really interesting story. Yeah. We used to have a window tax in America, uh, sorry, in the UK. And in fact, I think it was in like 1797 or something like that. And there were some German settlers in Pennsylvania and uh, some of the um, John Adams, some of the president's troops rode around Pennsylvania and they were basically, they were doing a census, basically working out who was where, Mm. but the German settlers thought they were about to (laughs) levy a window tax in Pennsylvania. And so they rose up in revolt and it took president Adams two years to put down the revolt called the Fry's rebellion. Mm. But yeah, we had the window tax in the UK for about 160 years. We had it and France had it for even longer. And, um, you know, it was initially levied in 1696, I think, um, to pay for a war. Most taxes are raised to pay for war of some kind. Mm-hmm. And um, the, you know, and initially it worked quite well and it was quite an easy tax to collect. The tax collector could just walk past somebody's house, count the number of windows and say, this is what you owe. And, you know, on the whole, rich people had more windows than poor people. So it mm-hmm. was sort of, you know, progressive in that sense of the word. And, But over time, the tax had the unintended consequence is that it made people ill because people, landlords, just built houses without windows or they Mm. blocked up all the tenement windows. And the poor, the damp, um, cramped windowless dwellings in the cities in the Industrial Revolution made all the cholera and the typhus and the various other diseases that were floating around at the time much, much worse. And remember, in those days, people didn't even have gas lighting, let alone electric lighting. You lit your house with rush lights if you were poor or tallow candles if you're in the middle class or if you were really rich, rich you'd use whale uh, whale fat. Oh uh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you if you were a Bitcoin millionaire in uh, in 1722, <laughs> whale fat was your thing. And um, the uh, so to lose your daylight was no small sacrifice. Right. You know, it was a it was a big deal. And they they fought. They were Charles Dickens wrote articles about it. Pamphlets were handed out. Songs were sung. They did scientific studies that proved that the tax made people ill. And the government just wouldn't get rid of it for years, decades and decades. And Mm. finally, they um, got rid of it. And I think 1850 something. I forget the exact date. And one of the reasons um, the the. 
UK Prime Minister at the time was able to get rid of it was that he just started levying income tax again. So it was uh, <laughs> replaced with income tax. Right. But yeah, so you see the cycle of um, a taxation in that sort of little. And, and I should say, the, and when they debated the matter in Parliament, there were cries of daylight robbery, daylight robbery. Mm. And that's where we think the expression comes from. Wow. But you see the cycle of a tax. Um, it starts off levels are low, levied at a time of need, usually to fund some kind of war. But then the tax just goes on way, way longer than it should. Right. And has all sorts of terrible unintended consequences. And government is very, very reluctant to get rid of it. Once right. you... Well, it always takes a new crisis. It always takes a crisis to get a new tax. And then right. once you've got the tax, it's very hard to get rid of it. Yeah, they never never want to relinquish revenue at all. So it's almost like, what is the old saying? That there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government solution. And once they put something Absolutely. in place, it doesn't go anywhere until it's you know possibly replaced by something else that does the same thing. I love the title, The Daylight Robbery, because initially I thought, well, that before reading the book, judging it by its title, was like, oh, it's going to be about inflation, people getting robbed in broad daylight, which I guess it does get into that later. Um, but I didn't know that specific story, which is so interesting and a great, a great call out on unintended consequences of human intervention. We always, we yeah. still think today we're going to solve the climate crisis, uh, you know, with a stroke of a legislator's pen, you know, a carbon tax or whatever, and it's like. That never works. We always trigger unintended consequences when we have coercive measures every single time. Um, sure. And the unintended consequences are often very hard to see in advance, right. particularly if you lack imagination, as many regulators and planners do. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, you often see that with government action. They just, they, you know, there's the famous, um, Bastiat theory about broken windows. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you, you break a window, it's good for the economy because the, right. the guy needs to hire a glazer to fix the window and that, right. that gets the economy going. And what you forget about the fact is the money that he spent fixing the window, he could have spent on growing his business or something else. And that right. whole part of the equation never gets factored into the, into the calculation that justifies the imposition of the whatever government directive it is. Absolutely. And you said you mentioned that governments are slow to relinquish revenue. Mm -hmm. It's not just the revenue that they're slow to relinquish. It's the control as mm. well. Both of those things. Mm. Once they've got it, you know, freedoms are hard to, they're hard won, as you're right. saying. But, but um, government, it's, you know, I, I see a, um, the gov government regulations a bit, like the blockchain in a way in that it, it just never stops growing right. you know how one one a block keeps on getting added to the chain yeah. and it grows and grows and grows regulations the same and government's the same it just creeps except it's not established by consensus right it's minority <laughs> tyrannizing majority typically but uh well yeah unless you uh, are a believer in uh, modern social democracy as a as consensus which i'm not yeah it doesn't seem like it's working exactly um the voice of the people definitely appears to be getting distorted through that governance mechanism. Um, but to your point, yeah, the, the, there's just this government creep until there's a social revolt of some kind. Uh, I forget who said it, but the, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. You know, we just, I don't know. It seems to be a recurrent theme throughout human history. But if we, Zoom all the way back to the beginning, maybe to pivot the conversation a little bit. How did this start? Where did tax come from? You know, what's its original purpose? How has it changed over time? I mean, where do we where do we begin this this long story? Well, there has never been a civilization without taxation. Hmm. I just think. You know, as Benjamin Franklin said, in fact, that Benjamin Franklin quote about um, uh, the only two inevitabilities are death and taxes mm -hmm. was actually from a, an English comedian who was originally said it in, uh, in, I think, 1716 in a farce called The Cobbler of Preston. Oh, um, really? I don't even know if Benjamin Franklin would have seen it. Um, he, he might have thought of the same line himself, but the, the first time it occurred in print was then. So there is a crossover between comedy and financial writing. But the, um, <laughs> in any case, there, there has never been 
it's likely that this sense of duty that we all feel to the greater collective will have existed even in the hunter-gatherer societies that predated civilization. Mm. And there, there has never been a civilization ever since without taxes of some kind. And there have been occasions where taxation has been voluntary, mm-hmm. which was something that the, was achieved in ancient Greece and in uh, and, uh, and maybe a few rare episodes uh, in the past. So I would argue that taxation of, you know, even, you know, we, many of us Bitcoiners dream of citadels and, and, and new nation states, independent nation states. But even in the Bitcoin community, there exists taxation. Mm-hmm. It's a form of voluntary taxation in the fees you pay to effect right. transaction in the miners fees and right. so on. So even in Bitcoin, there exists a form of taxation. Mm-hmm. And I would say that you get like taxation is a measure of freedom. And in the most enlightened societies where there were very high levels of freedom, mm-hmm. um, taxes tended to be very low. Margaret Thatcher famously said, uh, you can't have freedom without economic freedom. Mm-hmm. And in more totalitarian societies, you know, North Korea, for example, w- an ordinary worker doesn't own his own labor. Right. You know, a slave doesn't even own his own body. Right. It is, you know, so that's one 100% extreme. 100% taxed. As you, I think yeah. you make the point in your book, a slave is 100% taxed. Ax- absolutely. Yeah. And, and totalitarian is probably about 75 or 80% because mm-hmm. you get little black markets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Soviet Russia was about, tax was about, government was about 75% of GDP. Mm-hmm. And, and it, you know, the other end of the scale, you have an anarchy, but I would argue that in, even in an anarchy, you would have some kind of, taxation Mm -hmm. and the social democracies we live in today are somewhere in the middle of the two extremes taxation is roughly 50 percent of gdp it's actually higher if you factor in inflation right as i do i regard i I define inflation as a tax as the ultimate stealth tax right it is a form of control it is a form of coercion and it is a form of extracting wealth yeah um and but yes, nevertheless, America's probably about 45% of GDP and Europe, Western Europe's a, a bit higher than the United States. It may not feel it uh, uh, over there, but you're slightly ahead of us. Um, uh, in, in a good way, you're slightly freer than we are. And But there's also a relationship between like, so you that's your measure of how much of your labor you earn. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we say, oh, income tax was only invented in, you know, Americans say it was only invented in 1913. Um, and in fact, it only really came to every man in 1942 with the uh, Revenue Act of 1942. Uh, income tax was levied to pay for World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a famous uh, cartoon with Donald Duck happily going off and patriotically paying his income tax. Which was and said was to be a... temporary too, right? Another temporary yeah, oh, measure. Yeah. Yep. Um, oh, uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. We, we had income tax... Uh, introduced as a temporary measure in 1840 and here mm-hmm. we are yeah, yeah. <laughs> nearly 200 years later um but the and there was a great song actually sung by irving berlin um commissioned by the government i paid my income tax today a thousand planes to bomb berlin they've got to be paid for and i chipped in that certainly makes me feel okay i mean was wow. ever a, a link between tax and war <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> more wow. apparent but um So we tend to think of income tax as a modern thing. And the first income tax people usually say was um, UK, the England in the Napoleonic Wars to pay for the Napoleonic Wars. But in fact, the principles of income tax go all the way back to the ancient tithe, where you would give a tenth of your labor or a tenth of your produce to whoever your feudal lord was, your ruling lord. Mm. And the Bible goes on, you know, in Genesis and so on. They're always going on about a tenth. And they think it was a tithe, a tenth, because we have ten fingers and it was an easy number to calculate. Right. But in fact, if you find ancient Mesopotamian texts, they talk about the tithe there. And Mm. the principle of tithe, it's not a Judeo, just a Judeo-Christian thing. It's common to almost all religions. Mm -hmm. So that principle of the 10% um is, is pretty much everyone. And in 1900, at the turn of the 20th century, most um, Western societies, the United States, Western Europe, taxation was at 10% of GDP. Um, 
And Hong Kong, the most successful economy of the second half of the 20th century, tax, taxation was never exceeded 14% of GDP. Right. Um, so there are examples even today of taxes being being very low. Now, that was, um, um, and I, I, maybe we'll get into that later, but that uh, when you described Hong Kong's story in your book, I think it was in chapter two or three, that was the best testament to free market forces I've ever seen, right? They had oh my nothing God. basically, but then they instantly It became... was poorer than Africa. Yeah. 1945, Hong Kong was as poor as most countries in Africa yeah, on a per the, capita basis. The determination of the one individual, I forgot his name, starts with a C, basically was like, wait. wasn't tracking statistics. You know, he didn't want bureaucrats to have any, didn't want to have their fingers in the, the metrics trying to manage or, or measure the economy and just kept everything... All the tax rates flat and predictable to support the free market, and it just boomed. It became this, you know, global hub of commerce, mm -hmm. um, which is just incredible. Incredible, and the the Asian, all the tiger economies of Asia, sort of modeled themselves on Hong Kong. Right. You know, the Asian miracle is built on low taxes, individual labor, hard work, all right. the rest of it. It's incredible. Let me ask you this: so, this so, is a way. So, yeah. Go on. I, I was. We were. We were going to talk about the Stone Age, and of course, as it was, is that. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Please go ahead, and then I want to ask you just uh, a way I think about tax. Maybe after. Sure. Okay. I'm going to. I'm just going to change, change tack ever so slightly, Robert. While we're back in the Stone Age, and so we've got this idea of the hunter gatherer societies and the sense of duty to the greater collective. Um, and we'll come to the very first. The, the very first examples of handwriting, by the way, are tax records uh, in ancient Mesopotamia. And we'll come to that at the moment, this, this odd relationship. But back in the Stone Age, the, there were six metals that human beings, that prehistoric man came across as he hunted and gathered. Um, silver, tin, lead, iron, copper, and gold. And the very first metal that human beings used was gold. It was several thousand years, actually 20 or 30,000 years after he first, the first records we have of gold, which is in Paleolithic caves in Spain, that we have records of him using copper and so on. And because um, this is before the Bronze Age, and it was only in the Bronze Age that he discovered smelting and started using um, copper and tin. Now, in those days, alluvial gold was much more common and, you know, Stone Age man would come across it in riverbeds as he hunted and gathered. And he adorned himself with it, just like I've got my little gold necklace here. And as he adorned himself with bones and teeth and shells and precious stones, but also gold. Um, but at the time he was using tools made out of stone and um, bone and wood. He wasn't using copper and tin or lead yet, as I've said. Um, now, I want to think about beauty. Beauty and money. I presented a series on Italian TV about four or five years ago. Um, I'm half Italian, and it was all about beauty. And I didn't, I don't know, I have no idea how I got the gig, but I, I came to be a sort of mini expert on beauty as a result of this um, TV series. And Stone Age man was probably physically superior to us. He will have been stronger, he will have been fitter, he will have been faster, he will have had. Uh, acuter sense of smell, of hearing, of eyesight, because if uh, his uh, brain would have been quicker, he probably had would have had greater sense of geographical knowledge. He would have been a physically superior being to what we are today, because if he wasn't, he would have died. And so he and but he carries, nevertheless, all the same instincts that we have today, even with the modern life around us, um, a sense of of um, fear, a sense of hunger, a sense of desire. Um, he has all the same compulsions. Survival, the most basic compulsion of all. You have to find water and food and shelter for yourself and those closest to you. And what he also had was a sense of beauty. And I think that's quite, a, quite an important thing to think about. Now, we don't think of, of us having a sense of beauty, but he would have seen these little bits of 
gold glimmering in the riverbeds and he would have been compelled by them in the same way that people are compelled when they handle gold today there's a famous picture of vladimir putin holding up a gold bar and you just see he's looking he's utterly compelled by it. and if you've <laughs> yeah. actually held gold there is a, a magic to it i know bitcoiners don't like gold because bitcoiners and gold bugs are always uh, uh, loggerheads <laughs> but i actually believe there's there's room for both in this world agreed and and um so we have this we have basic instincts. We're repulsed or alarmed by things that are dangerous. Snakes, spiders, loud bangs and noises, cliff edges, all these things scare us instinctively. And we don't necessarily need to rationalize why they scare us. They just do. That's our instinct. And um, But similarly, things that are good for us in some way, we find beautiful. The sound of running water examples that's one of the most beautiful sounds a fit and healthy potential mate um the uh an open landscape this is a beautiful mm -hmm. one if you see there's if you there's a really common landscape picture that's like you know some of the most beautiful landscape paintings ever painted but also some of the most crappy cheap um picture postcards and on this landscape you will see an open plain usually with some kind of path going through it, a few trees, which you can run up if necessary, yeah. signs of visible life, you know, a, a couple of deer running past or something like that, mountains in the distance, some kind of water, river maybe, or a, a pond or a lake or something. And that, is, that kind of image is like the most generic landscape painting ever. You even see it on the, like the Mac, when you get your Mac computer, there's a sort of, yeah. that's the, the, the screenshot that the Mac comes with. And that landscape is exactly the landscape that, that the Pleistocene landscape that, that, that man was walking through. Uh, the, the, and he, on that landscape are all the things that we need to survive. Water, signs of animal life, trees for protection, potential shelter, mountains in the distance that you can run off to if necessary. and so. I would argue that it's our instinct that we that mm. we find that particular landscape beauty beautiful now when you find something beautiful neurological surgeons have studied this and they have found that certain parts of the brain activity in certain parts of the brain is stimulated and as i say our instinct for gold is that it's beautiful and that its beauty compels us. And, you know, gold is this incredibly pure substance. There's a truth to gold. There's an honesty to gold. And, but what um, my, uh, certain neurological scientists have all, there's a chap called Samir Zeki, and he's uh, found that, Professor Samir Zeki, he's found that when mathematicians look at um, a beautiful formula, or they solve a difficult puzzle, that the same part of the brain is triggered. Activity in the same part of the brain is triggered when we find something beautiful. Hmm. So there's this, and then, you know, Bertrand Russell and other philosophers have talked about mathematical beauty. And in fact, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks were convinced that beauty and mathematics were linked. And they, yeah. they um, used to measure, uh, um, proportion and the golden ratio and so on and think if, if buildings are in, built in this golden ratio of proportion right. this is then Pyth the pythagorean cult right ab absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. and so this is where I'm, i've brought this is a long-winded way of saying that the there is a mathematical beauty to uh, certain computer code. I bet computer coders, when they see some shit hot computer code or they write some beautiful code, I bet exactly the same emotion goes off that the mathematician gets. And there's this, there's a great quote. I'm going to read it to you from a poem called um, Ode to a Grecian Ur uh, Urn by Keats. And he says, beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Wow. And, powerful. and it is powerful. And the, now, so we, let's just bring that right to Bitcoin for a moment now. And, you know, 
one of the th- it, it it it's there's some it's slightly religious people's worship of bitcoin and in in a good way and but there's a beauty to it and there's a there's a mathematical beauty to it a computer coding beauty to it and there's the whole thing in vires numeris in truth numbers there's a yes. truth to bitcoin yeah the 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 block the permanence this is there are this many coins there's no inflation this coin is is you know it's, everything is on the blockchain stored record permanent and so i think that's the sort of the end of our first little chapter of this talk the relationship between beauty gold money mathematics pure money mathematics and truth that well if i may insert a pun here that was beautiful um <laughs> I will say, so Jordan Peterson, who I'm a big fan of, he describes beauty as a window into the transcendent, but I've never heard of this beauty described as truth as well, but that's a very interesting connection there because, you know, in theory, whatever is transcendental would be kind of the ultimate reality or truth in the world. And we see it, I guess we get a window it's interesting here too because I think that the transcendentals, the three things are truth, beauty, and goodness. I mm. think those are the three. Mm. And um, the, mm. the, the the so the other connection here is that we, we described so gold is naturally beautiful to ancient man. He sees it in riverbanks or whatever, begins to use it as a collectible, essentially, right? Starts to wear it yeah. himself with it. And as we know, um, I think this was William Jevons described the evolutionary phases of money, that it emerges first as a collectible, then as a store of value. Then when it's stored enough value, it starts being used as a medium of exchange. And then finally, when it's used widely enough, people use it as a unit of account. So it sort of, I, it I sort would, of bootstraps money in a way, right? Beauty. The initial- absolutely. I, this is something, a key thing I forgot to mention, Robert, and it, it ties in exactly to that, is... So he would, man would have found these bits of gold, these nuggets of gold. They're quite easy to mold. You can mold gold around. And he would have first used them as decoration. But the very next thing he would have used them for was as reward, mm. um, you know, for a heroic deed, for completing a task as an expression of gratitude. And thus would it have become a tool in barter right. and exchange. So I think the, 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 the reward I mean, what right. is reward is money. I mean, there must be, I don't know the linguistic crossover, but I bet there's some. So it's so these little bits of gold, long right. before we had coinage or smelting or anything, already gold was serving one of the purposes of money. And also, right. of course, declaring status. Right. Look at right, me. Right. I'm the top, I'm the top uh, uh, right. dude in this tribe. I've got the gold things. Mate with me, mate with me. Yeah. Uh, look at me. I've got the, you know, it's a real status thing, a beauty. So there's a, so it's an expression maybe of, of territoriality in a way, right? It's like, you're showing your position in the, the socioeconomic hierarchy, and then you're also using it to reward behaviors that you like, sure. right? If someone's bringing you food or, or mates or whatever it is, um, that's really interesting. So, and then you describe beauty, mathematical beauty, right? Where we see an elegant solution to a problem you know, E equals MC squared comes to mind. It's gorgeous, yeah. right? Describes mass, energy, speed of light. Um, if you've ever actually looked at the supply formula for Bitcoin, it's beautiful. It's just one simple little formula. It shows it keeps having until it hits 21 million and then it's done. Um, something, it's, it has its own mathematical beauty, you might say. I, I'm sure it does. I, I'm, I'm, I wish I was, but I'm not mathematical enough to be able to appreciate it but but i i know enough people who are and trust them to to accept that there is a beauty there so th- this is just, this is i don't know it's a really i'm i'm expanding my world view right now in real time to see this connection between beauty uh um as we discover a more elegant solution to a problem we're actually closer to truth now this is the the American pragmatist describing pragmatic truth, like it's very hard to disentangle something that's useful from what is true. Like if you have a map that gets you from A to B, is that because the map is true or because the map is useful, right? Usefulness and truth are very closely connected. So now we're describing this elegant solution as a form of, of truth or a window into truth, which is beautiful. So that's, 
very interesting connection there and it, it mm-hmm. and it causes money to emerge I, i've never heard about that or thought about that but that's that's a fantastic connection <laughs> Cool. Good, good start to the show. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say so. Um, I could, so, <clears throat> I'll let you continue. Should we, let's talk about the first blockchain, shall let's, we? Let's do it. So when human beings began to settle um, on the fertile plains between the Tigris and the Euphrates and you know, this is around about the time you've got all the flood narratives that are common to just about every prehistoric culture. And they were on, they were in the mountains and it's likely that the seas receded. Uh, water levels went down and that enabled um, hunter gatherers to come down from the mountains. And they found on these plains um, mud. And it, it enabled this mud enabled to, them to do all sorts of different things. Firstly, they could plant stuff in it and it grew. So they no longer needed to keep moving. They had a definite food supply. They could stay where they were. Mm. And crop yields were the like of which they never knew, they'd never known before. Before they'd had to, you know, keep moving. Otherwise they'd exhaust the natural resources of wherever they were. Mm. They used the mud. They baked it in the sun and they made pots with it, tools, sickles, hammers, that kind of thing. They found if you mixed it with straw, you could make bricks. And the bricks built houses and the houses became the first cities. Mm. And so for the first time, human beings had more than the bare essentials they needed to survive. And so trade in, I mean, we've already discussed, you know, this reward thing. So there was probably some kind of trade in, in hunter gatherer stuff, you know, barter, you give me that piece of uh, meat and I'll, or, you you know, maybe it was even something as simple as like, I'll hunt the food if you cook it. You know, that's a simple exchange and uh, that, that's much better for society because then one person gets good at cooking. The other person gets um, good at hunting and you have that little specialization and society mm. develops as a result. Yeah. So anyway, so you've got these first cities and but suddenly human beings are producing uh, more than they need. And. So they start trading goods and lords start demanding goods from their people in, in the form of taxes, you know, a tenth, tenth of your labor. Come and you know, you're going to come in the army and fight for me for a little bit. You're going to come and work for me and till my soil. And they started using this mud to make as money. This mud made money and they had uh, a disc would represent a sheep. Two discs would be two sheep. A cone would be a measure of barley. So two cones would be two measures of barley. So you've got your first little tokens. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they would bake these um, uh, clay tokens representing a debt inside a clay ball. And then when the debt was settled, the clay ball was smashed open. And that was the, the, that was the end of the trade. Hmm. And of course the most common debt that was owed was taxes of some kind. And then they found that actually it was quicker rather than taking these tokens and baking them in a clay ball. It was quicker to just inscribe the clay ball with uh, pictures that represented those tokens. Mm. And so did the very first system of handwriting uh, develop, the very first hieroglyphs. And the very first hieroglyphs, the most ancient documents we have, are all tax records. Mm but nevertheless, there in these clay tablets that, you know, have survived however many five, seven thousand years, whatever it is. Um, there's your first blockchain. These clay balls are your first little blockchains and these tokens. And. Um, so. And the people who mastered this new art of inscribing the clay were the scribes and the scribes were the first tax collectors. And they, the scribes were the tax collectors right through ancient Egypt and so on. There's this relationship. And the mm. scribes would often, often go on to, you know, work in the church and so on. It was always the, the church was often the most literate people. But the so there's this. You know, it was a good thing to master the skill of, I guess you could. It's like being able to write computer code today, I guess. Yeah, literacy. You, you know, and but so there's your first form of money. But you see 
the development from the ball to the hieroglyphs and then the constant evolution of the hieroglyphs. And that's why I argue that, that money is technology. Mm. Money is tech. As technology develops, so does money. Mm. And it's as much about communication, the technology, as it is about the actual money itself. So, for example, um, you know, when, when they invented coins, and we'll discuss early coinage later on, but when they invented coins, that was another great technological evolution that, that's lasted to today. We still use coins. Um, uh, the inventing of the printing press meant that we started using paper instead of metal. Mm -hmm. The emergence of digital technology in the 70s, I guess, and 80s meant that money stopped being paper and checks and um, maybe not in the United States, but elsewhere in the world, they no longer use checks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and we started using digital money. Mm -hmm. But also the very first money that was transferred between the United States and England across the um uh, across the Atlantic Ocean was able to be transferred because of the cable, the, the first mm. transatlantic cable that went through uh, under the ocean. And that's why the currency, the pound and the dollar, by the way, is called cable. That exchange is called cable because of the first transatlantic cable. Oh, interesting. But that cable through which people were able to communicate meant that money could be sent. As long as I knew the person that was receiving the communication on the other side was good, was reliable, um, uh, was a re reliable party, which he would have been because it would have been two banks, mm -hmm. or possibly even two people who knew each other sending the message. The, the debt was recorded. And so that was how the first money was sent. So money's mu as much about communication, writing, right. sending the messages across the channel, time stamping it on the blockchain. As It's as much about the developments as communi in communication as it is about whatever the underlying... Um, assuming it's a commodity money, whatever, mm. under, you know, whether if it's fiat money, it's backed by the law, if it's commodity, it's backed by <clears> commodity, <throat> but it's a, but whichever it is, it's the, 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 the exchange of the money depends on communication. Yeah. So we're the communication technology. We're, I mean, we're communicating ultimately a couple of ways of thinking about it. One is who has done what work, right. That's been valued by society. You can't just say, it's almost like we were competing in the economic sphere to render favors to one another. So we're trying to service market participants by providing them something valuable, doing, you know, satisfying their wants. And if we do that successfully, then we receive money. So the, the market communicates back to us that it likes mm -hmm. what we're doing. We then get this storehouse of money that we can go and use to redeem for our own want satisfactions from the market, anything the market can provide. So it is this two-way communication bridge. Absolutely. And if if somebody intervenes in the market, if a government intervenes in the market and upsets the balance of the market, then that communication is distorted. That's exactly right. And that's what we're suffering under today, like never before, is central bank price distortion and resultant capital misallocation. Mm -hmm. And I would take it a step further, which is a bit more of a nuanced argument. I think it's also at the root a lot of at a lot of our sociocultural pain as well. I think it's it's messing up people's minds and um, hundred percent the Antifa, the the attacks on freedom of speech, all of this craziness. I think it it is at least partially rooted in the corruption of the money. Oh, um, it's not partially. It's I would argue that a, a society. The values of a society are as sound as the money of that society. Yes. Money is the blood of a society. Yes. If the money's unhealthy, so is the society. And this sort of, you know, acceleration of divorce rates, uh, all the, excel the, 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 the frequency of bubbles, all the things that seem to be going wrong with the world um, with higher levels of frequency since 1971 are all to do with the deterioration in the soundness of the money supply. Absolutely. Uh, I would plug the website. I don't know if you've ever seen it, WTF1971.com. Yeah. Great collection of data on that topic. Um, so so the mud that the, uh, was this Mesopotamian society? Yeah, we're in ancient Sumer, ancient Mesopotamia. Yeah. Okay, so Mesopotamia. 5,000 years BC, I guess. They discover this mud that gives them staggering crop yields. So it's a great place to settle, grow food. It can also be used to 
It can be dried, you know, mixed with hay and dried to construct settlements. So also reinforcing their ability to stay there. And then it also gives them the substance in which to cast their ideas into tools, which is kind of a breakthrough, right? We didn't have metal mm-hmm. at the time. We didn't have manufacturing processes. Um, and then I guess, so, so that's when an economic surplus really starts to emerge, right? We start to create more savings than we consume day to day, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point, uh, based on my study of history, that's when government starts to really emerge, right? Is that we now had to have protection for that economic surplus. And that the government was essentially the, the first protection producing enterprise or ultimately a protection racket, right? I guess so. The, the, um, there was the distinction we might make today between king government, religion, God, right? Like the King was God Yes. in those days. Yeah. And, and you had to give your money or a bit of whatever to God. Mm-hmm. That's what you did. Right. So and the tithe um, was the original tax. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 And, but the, it's likely, um, I'm just trying to find this, there's a great little story you know, so th- th- you'd have the little tribes, the families, and they were always fighting with each other. And there was this um, one war where, which between Uma and Lagash, those were two of the tribes, mm. which Lagash eventually won. And Uma then had to pay a levy to Lagash to use the water reserves that they'd been fighting over. Mm. But even though Lagash had won the war and he had the money coming in from Uma, he didn't he <laughs> kept on with the tax on his own people that he'd it started in order to pay for the war in the first place. He didn't hard to relinquish the, the revenue. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly like the American government did in 1942, you know, brought yeah. income tax to every man. And then after the World War II ended, income tax stayed. Yeah. Um, and then there's a great quote from one end of Lagash to the other. Uh, wrote a scribe at the time there was the tax collector and they this resulted in a famous proverb from ancient sumer which was you can have a god you can have a king but the man to fear is the tax collector (laughs) (laughs) but the um and so there's this thing that the scribe wrote the head boatman appropriated boats the livestock official appropriated asses and sheep the fisheries inspector fish and then there was a, a new king came and he was one of history's first tax reformers and his name was Uru Kajina. And he replaced, he fired all the tax collectors, cut taxes, exempted, for example, widows had to pay inheritance tax if their husband died. And, and here was the very first, you know, tax reformer, the first sort of Ronald Reagan figure, if mm. you like, um, uh, all the way back in ancient Sumer. So, you know, history doesn't, re- uh, it d- does repeat yeah. the words are different, but the melody is the same. So I think this is a great place for the question I've been marinating over here. I, <clears throat> I've recently read um, a monograph from a guy named Frederick C. Lane. It's called the economic consequences of organized violence. And he just, he describes a lot of this process as well, where we can have this general anarchy in the beginning and then these little economic enclaves get established where there's a, a local, you know, God King basically protecting the borders, um, supporting the economic surplus. And then he, he just goes through that, uh, that sequence of, of economic development, how um, basically violence initially it's taking most of the economic surplus. And then over time, more of that surplus is accruing to merchants and, and that's how society proliferates. But so here's how I'm thinking about it is that taxation is network security. So the trade network is what's generating wealth. Um, I I guess it could also be, it doesn't have to be a trade network, could just be an agricultural network as well, irrigation Mm -hmm. network, producing wealth, crops, whatever it may be. The borders around that wealth generating source 
uh, are enforced by government, right? The biggest thug in the room. They're the producers of the crops or the economic surplus are paying the protect for protection to the government. So they're paying tax for protection, um, which is, you know, as we said, initially emerged as a tithe. It was the God, King, government, religion, whatever. So that tithe then goes to funding both warfare and in some cases, welfare, because I guess a, a big responsibility of the church, at least historically, was alms giving as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so just through that, that, just to put a modern computer analogy on it, like, okay, tax is network security. So, and it's really designed to protect property rights. Also. I guess you could say life, liberty, property, right? That mm -hmm. the security should be providing the insulation and preservation of natural law, more or less. And then that gives me a good framework to look at Bitcoin because you have Bitcoin with this, as you said, the transaction fees, which support network security, plus the mm -hmm. block subsidy, right? There's, there's pre-programmed inflation basically into Bitcoin, but it's, it's fully known. You know what you're getting into. It's not unexpected. Um, and those sources of revenue for the network basically are used to bootstrap itself into existence. So Bitcoin bootstrapped mm -hmm. itself into existence with transaction fees and block subsidies, kind of like the way civilization bootstrapped itself. Absolutely. Into existence and with the taxation. community grew. Yeah. The more the community grew, everyone, you know, in, in Hong Kong uh, in 1945, 1946, I think the population was five or 600,000. By the mid 1990s, it was 10 times that. Everyone right. moved from Hong Kong, especially from China, in search of opportunity. Right. And people of the Bitcoin community has grown because it's a well-managed community and people are, are happy to, to pay their taxes and pay their right. dues to the Bitcoin community. And they and it's been an opportunity to further themselves and grow themselves and 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 um, make their own fortunes, you know. And yeah, fair and predictable taxation akin to Hong Kong, which again, the Hong Kong story, I know we touched on earlier, but not only was it booming, but it also took all these um, bad situations that happened to it. It just kept, it was very anti-fragile, right? I think, mm -hmm. it, um, I forget, there was some war that cut off its, so whatever its main industry was, but then very quickly the Chinese migrated there. And the Chinese the Civil War, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they so had huge just, textiles. We'll, we'll talk about Hong Kong in, in due course. Yeah. So Sorry. just something that I've, I've been thinking about, I think others could think about is like, okay, governments are there to protect life, liberty, property. Uh, Bitcoin at least protects property at an exponentially lower cost than government. Uh, so if you look at it through that lens, it's Bitcoin really is just a superior form of network security for your property. I mean, granted, it's only monetary property, but, uh, you know, money is the ultimate property, right? Because you can redeem it for mm -hmm. anything else. So I think that that's, that's it. It has this low and predictable tax regime that people just migrate to, right? The more you're getting fucked by taxation or inflation, you just move to Bitcoin. Absolutely. And you, you are moving. I mean, this is the, the wonderful thing about the digital world. You know, there's the great, it's not actually that good an essay, but it's, he makes a wonderful point back in 2008, Peter Thiel. Mm -hmm. um, and he writes about how he was unable, he, he no longer thought it was able, possible to achieve anything, libertarian goals, through any kind of political activism. Mm -hmm. The process is too slow. You, you, there's just, you, you, you can't, you know, there's, there's the, the inherent problem with democracy is that a, a government promising to rob Peter to pay Paul can mm -hmm. pretty much count on the support of Paul. Um, and so if you are to make your libertarian citadel, if you are to advance the libertarian cause, you have to go to you. Ha the, the way to do it is through new technology mm -hmm. or cease or, or new frontiers, new lands, seasteading uh, in space. Now, we're probably space is, you know, Elon Musk's doing a great job, I'm pretty sure. But we're still away from being able to settle in space. Mm -hmm. Seasteading is hasn't quite taken off if my reading of it is correct. I think there are still some issues with borders in water. But, you know, the digital front frontier has been incredible. 
there's been no regulation of it because people are discovering the new technology, discovering the possibilities of it. And regulation is inevitably, you can't regulate what hasn't been invented. You know, right. the inevitably the regulator and the government of the of the wild west that is the internet and digital technology is behind and so the the, the lack of existence has just enabled this space to boom and so the new frontier is it's in the digital world it's not in the real world right and bitcoin is you know a huge huge part of that so where does that take it does that take us back to something that looks more like an ancient society more of this i know you talked earlier about the is it liturgy, the voluntary tax? Liturgy, yeah. Liturgy, liturgy. I mean, if the world moves that way, do we end up back in a... That, was it the ancient Romans that were practicing that? Uh, it was the ancient Greeks. Ancient Greeks. Liturgy was uh, a wonderful idea of the ancient Greeks where the taxation in ancient Athens was voluntary. Hmm. But it was, ex but there was this idea of benefaction that was embedded in the Greek psyche. You know, Prometheus gave mankind fire. Athena gave Athens the 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 olive tree. It was this this. It was just it's a re commonly recurring thing in Greek mythology. This idea of benefaction. I'd love to go. We talk some more about some other Greek myths in a, in a while when we go back to gold. Yeah. Um. The and. The, it was expected that the rich should had enjoyed unequal gains of the community and it was expected that they should give something back. And so if a city needed a new bridge or a new road or a new building or a new warship to protect its shipping lanes or a, a new games or a new theatre show or whatever, it was expected that the rich people would put it on, the Bill Gates or the Jeff Bezos or whoever would, would put this thing on. And not only was he expected to pay for it, he was expected to carry the work out himself and put his name on it. So it wasn't a bureaucrat taking your right. money from you and spending it with little experience managing. You know, it's easy to spend other people's money badly. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the liturgist had his own name on the project and he had his own, his name was online on the line and his wallet was on the line. So the result was that the liturgist would carry out the work in question to a very high standard. Probably higher than if it had been organized by some bureaucrat Definitely, somewhere. Yeah. And if you felt that, um, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, ancient Athens was, was just such a great society because, and, and, but it became a political tool because you would put your name on it. I think the Parthenon was a was a work of liturgy hmm. because people would put their name on it. And um, uh, so in order to earn status within the city, they would go, look, I've put on this wonderful games or I've built this wonderful building and people would gain political control. But that's bizarrely to the benefit of the city, because if all the rich in the right. city are going, look what I can do, look what I can do. And there's a competition yeah. when all the citizens benefit from that. So it's one of those healthy um dynamics in, in the same way i suppose you could say the same about bitcoin you invest in bitcoin then you start talking up bitcoin and yeah. you become a, a a salesman for it as soon as you've uh, invested in it um so it, you know it's one of those virtual um uh, virtual I the word for it. yeah but a, as exactly rather than yeah. a, a negative one yeah so that's how liturgy worked and if you if your time came around and um you felt that uh so let's say um I think there was like three or 400 liturgists in Athens at any given time. But if it was felt that if I felt that actually I shouldn't build the warship, I think, think that Robert Breedlove should build the war, warship. You could, uh, I could, we could go to a um, independent arbiter and I, sh I could go, I, actually, I think uh, Breedlove should pay because he's worth more than me. And Breedlove will go, no, I'm not. You're, you're worth more than me. And they were given the option of either carrying out the work in question or swapping wealth. Mm. So if you and I are arguing about who's more wealthy, and I'm saying you're more wealthy, and you're and you're saying to me I'm more wealthy, and the, in the, in the arbiter goes, "All right, well, just swap wealth then, swap assets." <laughs> Keeps them honest. It, it does. It does. Genius. I yeah. look. I mean, the um, so this is such a great example of the skin in the game concept. 
Yeah. Right. Where you're giving people a balance of incentives and disincentives to do good work. And this is really core to the free market where it's in our own selfish pursuits. We create this selfless result of, you know, more and better stuff in the world. But we've moved. It's not from the benevolence of the baker, the butcher, or the brewer that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Exactly. It's you know, it's it's ancient wisdom at this point, right? We it's embedded in capitalism, but modern society has moved so far away from that. We no longer have. We're no longer led by risk takers. I say people like the the liturgists that were taking risk on behalf of society. We're led by risk makers, frankly. These guys with no skin in the game that are stealing from some to give to others and inherently misallocating capital in the process. I think it's funny in in the UK and in Western Europe, much more so than in the States, we've often been quite resentful towards the super rich. Whereas a lot of the time in the States, you have this very kind of, oh, you look, you're, you're great, you're so successful. And the S- Americans are more... Um, appreciative of the success of the super wealthy. And I think it's because on the whole, and it's changing now, but until maybe the last couple of decades, the, the, the super rich of America have made their money through taking risks, through bringing entrepreneurs and so on. Whereas in Europe, the super rich, a lot of the time have got their money through some kind of crony capitalist suit mm, by yeah. securing some kind of legislation in their favor and mm. so there's this resentment because they know they've just manipulated the game better mm. um that doesn't exist in america but i think that's changing now because america's yeah. getting pretty crony capitalist as well absolutely yeah and it seems to be kind of the natural path of systems where people can change the rules right they end up just bending the rules more and more to their favor over time and then eventually you go from a a system of more pure capitalism towards something that's much more crony or, or communistic even. And that again, just back to Bitcoin is like, that's the core value proposition. It's a set of rules. Nobody can change. Yeah. So nobody can corrupt it. The only productive strategy is to go out and serve your fellow man. Yeah, that it is very good. The, there's a very interesting book uh, by, he's actually a bit of a lefty called um, Sam Wilkin an English economist. Uh, written a book called Secrets of the 1%. And he's, look at, he's looked at how the richest people in history uh, have all earned their money from Rockefeller to Bill Gates to Marcus Crassus to you know, various other super rich men through history. And he's concluded that the richest people in history made their money as much by risk-taking, in fact, more than by risk-taking, by once they'd got their little business by by making sure legislation was weighted in the favor of their business, mm. thereby protecting their monopolies. Mm. And he yeah. argued that JP Morgan did that. Bill Gates, like I think Bill Gates, you know, he's obviously not stupid, but he was born at the right time in terms of being at the beginning of computers. Mm. But I think his dad was a brilliant patent lawyer. Am I right mm. in saying that? And Bill Gates' wealth is as much down to the patents and the protection that he <laughs> got for himself as, as it is you know for the other from the his actual gifts as a computer coder right yeah i think there's a, something to that it makes all the sense in the world because when you you know typically in free market competition a lot of those monopoly profits would get competed away but if you can put a wall around it in the form of ip or, or anything else um you can remain a monopolist and and draw undue profits out of that business 